And here we are again, episode eight of the Just Covered podcast. If you listened to us before, you'll know that we talk about advisors and with them around their views and opinions and commentary in the intermediary space and the successful things that they're doing with their customers. And today we're really excited to be joined by Nick and Steve from Real Life Advice, who have recently won a BQA with us for Outstanding Customer Outcome. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Can you tell us a bit more about that winning entry? Yeah, I think um, the, the year running up to that winning entry was a bit of a transformational year for us. So when we set the business up, we, we really wanted to be a home for the clients of either wealth managers or mortgage brokers who, for whatever reason, weren't having the depth of protection conversation they wanted to have so they could refer those clients over to us. And in the year running up to the BQAs, it really was the year that we moved the model to that place where we wanted to be. So in the previous, previously to that, we'd been buying in leads. Um, and because of the nature of those leads that were coming in, we didn't really have the time to have the depth of conversations that we wanted to have. Um, so working with our network, we're within the Quilter network, we'd run a pilot for a number of years to try and attract firms to refer over to us. And the year running up to the BQAs was at the point where we got to the point where all of our leads were coming in through referrals, which is fantastic because it gives us a real sustainable model. Uh, a mixture of mortgage firms and wealth firms referring. Um, and because of the quality of those leads that were coming to us, it allowed us to really have a deep dive protection conversation. And that's really worked for us as a business in terms of our sales, the quality of our sales, our KPI, uh, the typical number of cases that uh, products we're selling per case and the average premium. So it, it, all of that um, really helped push our business forward. But at the heart of that was the customer. And it meant that we were able to have real deep conversations with our customer around their protection needs. Yeah, that's amazing stuff. And uh, you're telling us a lot about process there, which we'll delve into a little bit later. But I hear little birdie tells me you're repeat offenders or repeat um, successful advisors, if you like, successful um, entrepreneurs, if you like, with regards to our BQAs. You've won it before. Uh, yeah, we've won it twice and we've had a commended as well. So th three times we've entered and three times we've been on the on the podium. So, yeah, but I think that's just reflective of you've said process. We will talk about process, how we approach everything. And it's just having the customer at the heart of everything we do. Awesome. Awesome. So tell me about a little bit about your business then. How did it start? How did you come together? Uh, well, Nick and I have worked together for... 20 something years in, um, uh, you know, in, in various different areas of financial services. Um, but, uh, we ended up working together at a very large mortgage broker who we, somebody we'd known for a number of years, asked us to come in and help with some of the process that they were uh, trying to develop there, particularly around protection. So they had 30 mortgage brokers all doing their own protection. And whilst they were successful doing that. Uh, we worked out a better way of doing it, which was to set up a protection team within that business, uh, build a process that was centered around the client and a referral process from the mortgage broker to the protection team. Uh, and, you know, over the five years that we worked there, uh, we helped protection sales increase dramatically, um, probably three times what they were when we started working there. So. We saw an opportunity in the market in general for that model, but rather than an internal referral, an external referral, sort of an outsourcing uh, approach. So we uh, we approached Quilter and we said, look, this is this is what we think would work really well. Um, you know, a full referral model, um, so that mortgage brokers and wealth managers can get to do what they do really well, which is you know what they focus on. Uh, and we can pick up the protection and make sure that the client gets, you know, the the, the time uh, committed to them that they deserve and uh, an end-to-end -end process so that the outcome for the client is ideal. They get the, you know, superb mortgage or wealth advice, and then they get the depth of protection that they deserve. So it feels like you're you're complementing the services of those wealth advisors or those exactly. in the other the other financial areas that they they cover absolutely yeah i mean we, we when we first talk to a firm about referring to us we talk about us being being part of their value proposition and how they should introduce us as part of their value proposition so from the client's perspective it, it makes sense it's a seamless journey and they know that they're getting the right expertise from each part of the journey fantastic so in terms of when you're i suppose putting yourself out there meeting firms for the first time giving them 
pitch about what you said. What are the key things? What are the key sort of benefits to a wealth advisor, to a mortgage in protection, or a mortgage advisor, if you like, yep. in, in partnering up with yourself and, and, and yeah. doing what you but do? I, th I think the, the biggest challenge for us is to build trust because you're actually asking somebody to hand their clients over to you. And the, the line that, that, that I always use, because it's true, is that if somebody refers a client to us, we're a custodian of their client and we never lose sight of that. So when we structured the business, we structured it with a business to customer element, which is our advisors doing their job, but also with a business to business element. So we understand or we think we understand and we work with the firms who refer to us to understand what's going on in their world, what's important to them and what's important to them about us as custodians of their client. Um, so it's about having that relationship so that there's never any surprises for the referring firm and there's never any surprises for their clients. Um, and what, what, when we first started off, we spoke to a few firms and we said, okay, if you've done this in the past, what's been the problems? And then we set up to say, well, let's put those to bed up front. So things like reporting loops. So if somebody sends a, a client over to us, we should be able to tell them at any point in time where we are on that client conversation, because if they're going back to have a conversa conversation about the mortgage or do a review, they've got to be able to know where, the, where us as their protection partner are on that journey with their client. So it's very much about having that that side to our business that looks at the business to business element as well with our referring partners. Because yeah, I, I think that's, you know, when we go out to firms and like look at different advisors in the network, we're always told um, by advisors it's a time element or, you know, they're not enough specialist enough. You know, there's always a reason yeah. as to why maybe they haven't sold as much protection as they wanted. And I know when I was advising, my preference was always, well, I, I did the protection as part of my the process of the firm the company I worked for. I had to do the protection myself. But it did mean if I was short on time, it was the first bit that maybe got cut um, because I had to get the mortgage through. That was what the client needed and wanted there and then. Um, so when we talk about that referral across, like how quickly do you see those customers on the back of their wealth or the mortgage um, appointment? So... We have a particular stage in the process that we ask for if it's a mortgage client to be passed over to us uh, and we will contact that client normally the same day um, uh, to book them in for a, an appointment because we have a structured sales process that, that sometimes is two or more meetings. Uh, so, But the important thing is that they're already positioned by, by the referring partner, the you know, mortgage broker or wealth uh, manager who's positioned us as experts in what we do. And I think customers these days are, are, you know, I think they're quite grateful to be told, look, I'm going to give you to an expert. Um, and, uh, you know, it seems to work very well. So we get in touch with them as quickly as possible and book that appointment in, uh, which will be, you know, at their convenience, obviously, but normally within a few days. And typically we'd also ask if there's two people, two, two, you know, husband and wife or partners, We'd, we'd want both of them on the call at the same time. So we'll schedule a time when they can both be available. And sometimes that means conferencing them in from two different places, but we'll do that if necessary. Yeah, I remember yeah. having to do that quite a few times yeah. when I was doing it. You mentioned time. I mean, the word time's come up a few times, and, and that's part of the sell, I guess, to referring firms, is we're giving back them the time to focus yeah. on their core proposition so they know they can use that time to get the best commercial return from it. And we can get the best re commercial return for them if they refer over to us on the protection side. And I think you're so right. What tends to happen is if anybody's time pressured, the protection element falls away. Uh, and we're there as, a, as, I guess, a backstop to, to help people avoid that. Yeah, especially if you've got things, you know, I guess, challenging underwriting or if they've got pre-existing. Do you see a lot of that coming yeah. to you? Yes, we do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we're happy to deal with non-standard cases um, because because we're in that space all the time. We have an intuitive understanding of product providers and what they're looking for and how they ask the questions and how they'll relate to different conditions. Um, so we're able to deal with that efficiently and effectively. And it's and it's also another good way of building trust. So if somebody starts off by referring a non-standard case and we do a good job, then you build the relationship from there. And if you think about it in an advisor's mind as well, they might be thinking, if it turns into a non-standard case, that might be why they're thinking, well, I wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> so you've proved yourself straight away, haven't you? Yeah. I guess it's like a mortgage advisor. You know exactly where to place the mortgage because you're an expert in it. Or wealth advisor, you know exactly where to place the wealth if they want sustainability or, you know, depending on what that person wants in a portfolio. So you're then just taking that to the level of, 
let's be the protection specialists and know exactly what gets placed where and guess that makes it more efficient for you guys versus someone yeah, else. And, and the other thing I'd add to that is that, you know, we do have a really you know, strong culture within the business of teamwork. So the advisors sit together and, and they very, you know, they really do work together. So even to the point where if, there, if one advisor hears somebody on the phone talking about a particular health condition, they'll, you know, they'll pass notes or, you know, they'll teams them on which insurer might be better for, for that particular health condition. And that's the depth of knowledge that, you know, with the best will in the world, I don't think somebody who focuses on mortgage or wealth is ever going to get to that level of knowledge. And with underwriting uh, turnaround times, well, GP turnaround times right now for medical reports being as they are, um, you know, having that knowledge means that you can get somebody insured much more quickly uh, and not wait for sort of six, eight, 12 weeks for a GP report to come it's back. It's those synergies, isn't it, of those ideas, what has worked for someone in the past, yeah. someone happens to be in the office, they over here. Also, I suppose when you're talking about getting information back from GPs, you, you probably know when's the sweet, the exact sweet spot and when to actually maybe contact GPs to find yeah. out whether they can provide the information that you require or the provider yeah. requires. So you're building up all of that sort of knowledge of the different, I suppose, elements of the chain each way along, aren't you? Yeah. 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 And also because, you know, it's what we do, we, we have uh, uh, the support in-house for calling round to underwriting departments if we've got a case that we need to test, um, you know, underwriting so that we aim it at the, the right insurer. Um, and we've also got the resource to chase GP reports and medical screenings and things like that, that if you're doing a different day job, being a mortgage broker or wealth manager, that's tough to do, you know, having the time to do that yourself or diverting your resource to do it, you know, it's time consuming and expensive. Yeah. Definitely a USB out there to, to offer that in such a successful way. Mm. Not to just rock up and say, oh, we'll take the protection leads off you, actually. Mm. Have that backup and the processes mm. and all that type of stuff. I just want to take the opportunity to, I suppose, take, take things back. So when we caught up before, I think you both mentioned you've got a training background. And, and, and we're really interested in that only because both the things myself, Hazel, have done in the past and, and currently. Mm -hmm. How did you find the transition from training to actually doing it for yourselves in a business environment, coaching everyone, getting the processes in place. What challenges did you come up against? How did you find it? Um, I think we were quite lucky because whilst we, we, we do both come from a training background, we, we come to training through sales. So we understood the sales space. Yeah. Um, and we'd both been involved in training both on a corporate side, um, but also on a consultancy side. Okay. Um, so... So I think that gave us a bit of a bridge. If you work on the consultancy side, you, you start to develop a bit of a self-employed mindset as well. Um, uh, I think if we, if we look at why we set the business up, our, one of the reasons for it, other than the commercial reasons, it was to take everything that we learned and put it into practice. So I think our challenge was how do you take stuff that maybe is a bit theoretical or you've worked with other people and put it into a practical yeah. environment? Um, but that was also about then following good practices around being really honest with ourselves, giving ourselves feedback on how we were doing and building in feedback loops from from our staff, from our customers to make sure we were delivering on our own objectives and our own purpose as a business. Um, engaging our staff, so using the things that we'd co coached people to do and making sure we did them ourselves. So we have a very collaborative leadership style, for want of a better terminology, but then it's making sure you live that. Keeping yourself in check, Absolutely. Isn't it? So it's checks and balances um, around making sure that you're actually delivering on your purpose, your objectives, your brand values, um, because it's very easy for that to slip, particularly if things get tight and you've got commercial pressures and you get squeezed, it is easy for, it, for that to slip. But um, yeah, I think that engagement and keeping ourselves honest has been the most important thing. And that's allowed us to take our experiences from the past and move that into a the commercial environment. There's some important yeah. cultural elements there. Very much. You've stuff. had some positive effects on staff retention on the back of that, I presume, because they need the knowledge in that sort of job as well, don't they? Yeah. Are you, you want to talk about that? Or? Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> so one of the things that's really important to us is making sure that the staff are happy. So we work, you know, a fairly flexible, um, you know, no, there's no clock watching in the office. They, you know, they, they know how many hours they need to do and we let them manage that. So we, we try and create a good sort of work-life balance so they can go and go to sports day and do the, that kind of thing. So 
those hygiene factors are, you know, we believe in a lot. Um, but also, uh, we believe that the way to retain staff is to give them a structure that works so that they f can achieve great uh, levels of success um, off the back of what they're trained to do. Um, and, um, you know, that, that training, I think, comes through into the process that we use. So our process is not I wouldn't, you know, we don't like to actually call it a sales process because it's a, it's a structure that really takes a client on a journey and it educates the client. So in effect, we're not training clients, but we are educating clients through the process because it works on the basis that if, if a client truly understands the risks they're walking around with and they, they know there's a solution to that, well, if they've got a reasonable amount of intelligence, they'll opt to take a solution rather than continue to carry those. So I agree with you on that. <laughs> continue to walk around with those risks, particularly if that, that, that solution is affordable and within a budget that they've given you, why wouldn't they do it? So, you know, the process is all geared around that concept, which is, you know, we, yeah, we want to develop our staff, but also if we educate our clients, then, then when money gets tight with them, it's the very last thing they're going to cancel on their list of direct debits because they know it's not, it's not an insurance policy with LNG. It's a way of keeping the family in the house. It's a way of making sure that there's income, you know, ongoing income if something happens to them through a sickness or injury or, or you know, family income benefits and ongoing income to the family, even though the mortgage is paid off. So they, they get it from a conceptual point of view. It's not just a policy to them. So I think, you know, our backgrounds have sort of, bled into everything that the business is about. Mm. Yeah, and I guess that must fill the advisors with quite a lot of confidence because, again, just thinking of, you know, that if any wealth advisors, mortgage advisors are listening and they maybe think, well, how do I know the quality is going to be right? Or how do I know if I send my client in that they are going to get the, the best possible advice? What kind of uh, do you look for in your staff? And what training do you tend to then give them when they join? Yeah, I, th I think that's a, a really good point. Um, and almost speaks back to your question about the move from training into running a business. I mean, when, when you're training, you don't get to choose the people that you're in front of, whereas we really do get to choose who we bring into the team. And and, and we've learned over the six years around exactly what our model requires. Um, and it, it is, it's almost as much about the value, the values that the person has and their attributes as much as their skill set. We can train the skills but they need to want to be part of the team. They need to buy into what's important for us. They need to genuinely care about the customer. We can layer on the skills. And, and we, we talked about we have a script, which really is a very detailed process, and the clients would never know it was a script. But that does give the advisor the, the track to run on. But then the training we give is really about the skills, building out the skills and really how they humanize that. And, and that makes them happy. They feel they're getting development and supported, so that gives them... Um, <coughs> excuse me, excuse me. That gives them a real buy-in as well. Um, we went through some changes last year where we we did change the team slightly um, to make sure that we've got exactly the right um, advisor mix for working with um, referred leads. So they really understood the importance of the relationship with the referring firms. They bought into that. So that that's really is fundamental for us recruiting the right guys who want to be who want to develop who see our vision and want to be part of it. Really important. I, I totally agree. And just linking back to, to Steve's point around getting customers educated so they can see those risks, so they can see the importance of their family and their financial future, and then, then being able to consciously make an informed decision. Yeah. Because it is as simple as that, as, as you've yeah. said. It's just getting to that and then having that blueprint process in place to get there. So... I'm just interested on on the sort of retentions piece, which is one of the reasons you won the, the yeah. BQI awards this year and previous years. So, how much of that is part of that selling part in terms of, or sort of education piece, and then how much of it is the the types of leads you get, the relationships you build? I'm just interested to talk a little bit further around those two areas, and then how you end up at such great retention rates. Well, I think it's all of it. I think. Um... I think if you've got a great process but terrible profile of lead, then you're never going to have top level retention because of the profile of lead you're dealing yeah, with. Yeah. So I think you you need the whole piece, and the 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 best way uh, to have great retention rates uh, is, is to have uh, quality 
the, the profile of your leads, you know, at the top end of quality that they've been recommended to you by somebody they trust. They've got clear needs. They're run through a process that helps them understand those needs and their solutions are designed to a budget that they've told you they can afford. Um, so if, I think it's an end to end thing. I don't think there's any one thing that you do. Um, and that's given us, you know, the, uh, the quality, uh, that we currently have. And how do you balance the, the client contact post sale then? Because obviously they could be clients of wealth advisors, mortgage advisors as well. How, how do you dovetail in line with what they do? Well, um, I think that, you know, we, we contact clients annually and offer them a review. Uh, but from a protection point of view, you know, not all clients need an annual review, but we, it's good that they get offered one. Um, and there is a clear line. And the, the one thing, you know, as Nick said, we are the custodian of those clients. Yeah, of so course. anything to do with their mortgage or their wealth, they know they go back to their, you know, mortgage or wealth broker for that. And they could be signposting you anyway as part of their reviews. Can't yeah. They? I presume that happens as well. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And if things change, in their situation that we spot, then we, we point them back. Um, and likewise, you know, if they come up for a remortgage, then they tend to get sent back to us by the mortgage broker. So, you know, something's changed. You need to speak to real life yeah. advice again. And there's other tactical things we can do. So if we find out that somebody's canceled a direct, direct debit, we have a process to follow up with that client. But if for whatever reason, the client doesn't want to speak to us and it does happen sometimes we can go back to the referring firm and say, look, is what's gone on and they've got an opportunity then to speak to the client themselves so that it's about that no surprises and being consistent and i think the thing i'd just lay on top of, of what steve just said it, it it is everything that you said that makes it work right from the beginning with the referring firm positioning the relationship the right way but then the key for us is excuse me <clears throat> it's to be disciplined and consistent so every client gets the same experience i mean we're in many ways we're quite boring because we know it works so we just do it the same way. And, and we also need our advisors to buy into it so they do it the same way because as soon as people go off piste, that's when it can start to go wrong. So it is about having the discipline to believe the process and keep working it the same way. I love that because we hear that, well, it was always an industry kind of fact when I was even going through my training as a training advisor, you'll get like 20% of people will never take protection, 20% absolutely always will but then you've got 60 percent who need influenced and i always say that to advisors don't let it be a lottery like it's not fair if that person goes to one advisor and would take it go to a different advisor and wouldn't and i guess that's where your process and script really make sure that that 60 percent who can be influenced are actually getting a fair influence regardless of who they speak to yeah and we, we particularly like it when we look at the client feedback we get which is on our website and it says things like the advisor was patient. They took their time. They really listened to me. They helped educate me. And that's where we know the process is working because that's how clients feel as if they're being held and looked after through the process and that we've got all the time in the world to help them get to where they need to get to in the decision-making process. And I, I'm really curious about expanding upon that a little bit, actually, just as I, I'm thinking of the things you're saying. You've mentioned a lot about client education and obviously retention is a massive part of that because if you've educated them, you've shown them it's a personal plan for them, they're likely to, to stay on the books. Um, within your process, where does it start? So what kind of language do your advisors use and, and what products do they tend to bring up or how do they actually address the, the customer in front of them? That's a big question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's quite a broad question, but... So in our process, um, I'd say the first 10 or 15 minutes that our advisors are on the phone with a new client, they don't talk about insurance at all. Uh, they, they're getting to know the client uh, and it's all, it's all positioning. It's, it's, um, letting, it's setting agendas and, and expectations with the client about what, what process we're going to go through. Um, and it's all about making sure that the client's in the right space to have those conversations so we you know we we talk about uh you know where they are in the process how the process is going to work so there's you know the client feels quite relaxed about it and we explain to them look there are no right or wrong answers to this this is unique to you you know there's no point in saying what does what should i do because it's actually your choice what you do 
you know, we'll propose solutions to you, but it's ultimately is your choice to do it. So the clients are very relaxed. And in the first call with the client, there's no, there's no selling at all. We don't, we actually don't talk about insurance products other than the ones that they currently own. We, we ask them what they've got, uh, why they bought it, what they know about it, uh, and what they have at work, obviously, because we need to know those things, but we don't, we don't sell the attributes of, you know, critical illness or life insurance or, or IP at all. We talk, we ask some questions about what they would want to have happen if something happened in any one of those areas. And we talk about what their options might be and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and that comes out in the summary, you know, so what you're saying to me is, you know, is that something you'd like me to look into for you? So that's the extent of, of what we do in, the, in that first call. So, so in terms of going back to your question, you know, it, it, is, it is quite a lengthy process. Uh, but at the end of that initial call, which is normally about 45, 50 minutes, um, the clients have had quite the journey because they thought about things they've never thought about before. They've never thought about, well, if the mortgage wasn't paid off, what would my wife do or what would my husband do? They've never, they've never had to think to that level. They just think, oh, well, hopefully it won't happen to me. Uh, but we, we get them to think those things through. Yeah, and I guess that's saying nobody wakes up wanting this, do they? And they, no, or, or, exactly. they, or that's the kind of bury the head in the sand. That doesn't happen to me. That happens to someone else over there, doesn't it? And I think when um, we did some research recently and we interviewed some of the industries like top advisors across wealth and mortgage who um, either refer well um, with protection or they sell it themselves um, and that was absolutely the key thing that came from that research was they do not mention the product mm -hmm. they literally just talk to that client about what do you need what do you currently have and then right at the very end they say here are the solutions to those needs that you've you've covered off so it's really interesting you've managed to weave that really skillfully in your in your process because said from that research we did that absolutely was like the number one thing that that was quite starkly obvious uh, that was the right thing to be doing. So. And I think that speaks back to what Nick said earlier. You know, we, we, we knew all of this because yeah. we've helped other companies with it and we wanted to bring it all together into, you know, real life advice. And I think, you know, the, the BQAs is, is, you know, really, uh, you know, for, from our point of view is great confirmation because we're being compared to what else is going on. But, you know, our, our retention numbers and, our quality stats from the, the LNG provider and other insurance companies also confirm it. And if you do the right thing all the time, you will get, you know, the, the right numbers and the right uh, customer outcomes. And I guess for, uh, just going back to that 45 minutes, I, I think a lot of advisors who are listening might be quite shocked by that initially, because I think if advisors were to actually critically look at themselves, you know, who maybe do the protection themselves. I don't know how many of them listening would be able to say, I actually do take the time to spend 45 minutes doing that initial fact find, but mm. clearly it links into your retention and the quality of the advice you're giving. And, and, and not just that. So the retention and quality advice is obviously very important, but it also means that we average 2.3 product sales per client case. We average over £75 a month as an average premium so there's a commercial driver for spending that time as well you get the reward um, but you know it's it's we we say so many times around the other you get you do the right inputs you get the right outputs and that's where i go back to it's about consistency and having our team be absolutely disciplined about how they do it because if you cut corners in that first part you won't get the same results and that's not doing the right thing for the client you know we don't think about consumer duty we can't cut corners in that first part of the conversation and leave the client exposed. No, I totally agree. Uh, you know, love what I'm hearing. And I was going to mention that you took the word straight out of my mouth, consumer duty. You, you've been doing it in advance as we move towards the, the deadline date at the end of July. Sounds like what, what are you doing with that sort of putting customers at the center of what we do, that North star of ensuring good outcomes for customers is there that you're doing every day. So how have you, how have you found it? Has it been more or less, Picking the tires on your process is more of the same or, or what type of improvements, what type of changes have, have you had to make, if any? It's certainly made us take a step back and look right. at all our processes and say, okay, are there any gaps here? And talking to the team about it and making sure, again, that they're, they're really bought in and they understand the importance. Um, we're quite lucky as well that we have a CRM system where which pro all of our client communications inbound and outbound go from. So we've got audit trails 
of everything that goes on anyway. Um, we've checked those to think about are there are we making sure we're capturing all the detail we need to capture. You know, if a client, for instance, doesn't want to go ahead, making sure we we capture the right information because we haven't just got a duty to ourselves, but we've got it to our referring firms as well to make sure that we we you know comply with their aspects of compliant consumer and duty. They're going to have to note that anyway, aren't they? They are. It's part yeah. of their own process. Yeah. So that's part of the reporting back feedback as well. Yeah. So it, it you know it keeps everybody in the place they need to be around the consumer duty. Um, but but broadly speaking, um, I think because of our process, you know, we feel very comfortable that we're behaving the right way, and the clients getting the right the right attention and the right outcomes. Yeah, yeah. You, you mean some of the wording you've even used is, I think you used a word in earlier. Is you said making an informed decision, the clients making that decision. I think that is absolutely what the consumer duty is about, isn't it? It's not forcing people to go down a a route of you must have protection, but it's absolutely allowing them to feel empowered to say. I understand it I'm not not for me or I understand it and I can only afford x eh? and that that absolutely is sounds you've got that spot on with yeah. what you're doing and one of our objectives is to cover as many of the clients mitigate as many of the clients risk areas as we can within the affordable budget mm. for them that's really what we're setting out to do in each conversation and in terms of that, have you noticed, because um, a lot of the questions I'm getting asked by advisors out and about at the moment um, is, are we in legal in general seeing a difference in premium size? With, obviously, we just had base rate go up again uh, last week, it was, you know, time of filming today. Um, have you noticed any differences in that kind of conversation with clients with cost of living and the recession potentially up and coming? Well, I think clients are very aware because, you know, they're, they're, uh, you know, taking mortgages out that are costing them a lot more than they thought. Um, so, uh, you know, as of right now, we haven't seen it hit our average premium, but I think that might come back to the fact that we're dealing with a really good profile of client. Uh, but inevitably it is, I would imagine, probably going to hit the, the market. Um, the important thing for us is that, you know, when we speak to clients, we get a budget that they're, comfortable they're going to be able to afford not just now but on into the future yeah. um so that, that that's probably you know where we're at. I, I i think in the months to come we might see a bit more and learn a bit more about mm. customer habits but right now that's what we're seeing yeah we have had a couple of client conversations where a client has, has maybe had two or three um, products and they've cancelled a direct debit and and we've had to accept and respect that, but then we've diarised to have a conversation and down the line to review what what the affordability looks like and whether their circumstances have changed again. So it's not a case of letting it go because it the direct debit's bounced or whatever. It's about okay, what's the plan then to pick this client up again because the need won't have gone away. So how do we help pick right. them down the it's line? It's part of that journey, isn't it? it is. of, the, of their financial lives and, and also linked to their personal lives. So that, that informal approach that you take, they feel engaged because you've taken the time to talk to them and, and talk their language and find out exactly what their, their hopes and dreams are. And then with regards to if you're then approaching them after a situation where they have had to cancel and you're talking to them again about it, particularly if you'd even said it as part of your, your process early on, if things do change, because I'm sure you do because mm. things in life change, You've then picked it up with them to see, okay, what do we do now? So I, I think certainly from from other advisors I've spoken to out in the industry, like yourself, successful firms and, and such like, it it's, seems to be definitely the right thing to do. And you're again trying to make sure that those customer outcomes, those poor outcomes, are, are, are foreseen and avoided. Yeah, and treating them as individuals. Yeah, uh, absolutely treating them as individuals based on their circumstances at that point in time. It all sounds very supportive. You know, I think as a client, you'd feel supported, not someone just calling you to say, well, you've cancelled this. How how do I get more business? You know, it's it almost sounds like a very supportive and, and transparent uh, conversation. How does that initially happen? So do you email them or is it a phone call? How would you actually re-engage with those customers that maybe cancel a direct debit, say? Well, I mean, thankfully, we don't get a huge, we do get yeah. a bit, but not a huge amount. But yes, uh, we, you know, we use the systems that are provided by LNG and other insurers that, you know, as soon as we find something that uh, has raised a, um, you know, a concern, so a misdirect debit, we will phone them straight away. You know, that's, that's what we don't write to them. We've, we phone them. If we can't get hold of them, then we'll email and text them and 
We yeah. can do all that through our CRM system. So we run it as a workflow on yeah. the CRM system to make sure nobody gets missed. Um, and then, as, as I think I mentioned earlier, after a number of attempts, we'll then go back to the referring firm and say, here's the situation, because it may be – and you never know what's going on for the client. They may feel embarrassed. It might They feel uncomfortable having the conversation. They may feel more comfortable with the firm that's referred them over. But we'll, 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 we'll try different ways to try and get hold of the client. It goes back oh, yeah. to that personal touch, isn't it? Not yeah. just a, a blanket email. It's actually, I'm going to take the time to phone that person and see what's happened, not a, why have you cancelled? It's just, yeah. what is your circumstance now? Which is far more personable and almost soft touch, but I'm just putting myself in the shoes of a customer. I'd probably be far warmer to that than just an email saying, why have you cancelled <laughs> this policy? And the person who calls them is the advisor they spoke to in the first place. So it's the person who knows yeah, them and yeah. has that relationship in place, as opposed to you thinking it's part of an admin function. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot goes on other than that first meeting as well. You know, you've got that first 45, 50 minute meeting, but they get a very detailed email of recommendations and then a second call which is also structured, very highly structured, that links back to the conversation that was had in the first uh, call. Um, so, and it's all geared around the words and the things that the client said to us. So what you said to me was, this happened, this is what you'd want to have happen. So I've gone away and looked at the market and found a product that was sold. So it's all really, really tied together. Uh, and once the products are, are, you know, through underwriting and, in, and on risk, we, we then have a welcome pack, don't we, Nick, that, that, that we also think is a great retention tool. Um, so the welcome pack goes out to the client from us because obviously, you know, they'll have various things from the insurance companies and, you know, via a portal or in, in hard copy. But we send a hard copy out to them, you know, of the, the, um, the products that they've bought, the um, demands and needs letter on the front of that and it's a proper nice folder that they get to keep with the advisor's business card and things like that because insurance is very so it's not a really very tangible product is it you know I, did i buy something i'm not sure i see a direct debit going up but this is a way of having something through the post that says right here is what i've got when they open it up it explains that journey they've been on so the things that they told us were important and what we've done about it is very clear and concise. So if things get a bit tight down the road, they're going to go to that folder. And one of the things they're going to read is that demands and needs letter, reminder, which clearly explains what we did, uh, you know, what they did and why they did it, you know. So who knows, you know, that, uh, so that we believe that's helping it. That personalization then of that demands and needs letter mm. Is it, I'm presuming from what you're saying, it's, it's very well personalized to that situation for that particular client? Yeah. I mean, we're lucky through the systems that we have uh, through the network, through Quilter, we do get a, a, a demands and needs letter that's, you know, supplied to us. But then we he heavily tailor that to the client right. so that, you know, it is very personalized and we use their words and why they wanted things and, you know, what they said they could afford and, you know, why we're recommending what we're recommending. And the other thing that we have in the welcome pack is um, there's a, a sheet in there about what to do in the event of a claim, because often the person who's making the claim isn't the person who took out the insurance. So it's, it's actually just about trying to make it easy for people and show them how we can support them. Uh, so it, uh, again, when we were building the welcome pack, we said, okay, we're the client now, stand in their shoes. What was a client? What do we need under different circumstances? So we, we try and do that, and I think that goes back to your question about moving from training to a commercial environment. Just by our learning of sta where we used to say, okay, stand in the delegate's shoes, stand in the client's shoes. Love that, what to do in the event of a claim, because like you say, it could be someone else, or, or even if with quick illness, they may not be able to do it themselves. Oh. They'll be well, vulnerable, my, won't they? My family will laugh at me, because I said that when I moved in, uh, when James and I moved in together, just what, I'll be coming up two and a half years past December, um, you also all think I'm sad probably. I sent my mum, dad, sister and him an email saying, this is what I've got and this is how to use it if anything happens. Yeah. Because you you don't remember, even I didn't actually remember it being, a, you know, an advice background. I had to when I was moving, sit and actually look at what do I have, what are the balances, especially some of the DTA stuff. I was like, I don't actually know what the current level is, like I'll need to go and check. And uh, they all laughed at me. They were like, this is ridiculous, like putting together this email. But I was like, well, 
if I'm not there and I'm the one that gives all this family the advice tends to be, then well, how do we know what, what to do? So yeah, it was quite funny. I'm glad you've done it for your, your clients, save them sending that round. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, we talked a lot about trust today with clients, relationships, all those types of things. I'm interested around actual trusts themselves. Uh, how much do they form part of the process that you've got in place? Yeah. I mean, our trust statistics are very high. Uh, we, you know, where, where it's appropriate, we'll, we'll always recommend that something goes in trust. And if it's possible to do it online, then we'll do it as part of the application process. Um, so, um, you know, that, that's the best way to do it. Um, but if it isn't possible to do online, then what we'll do is, you know, the paperwork will go out in the post and those trust documents will be sat within that welcome pack as well. Uh, so if a claim happens, then everybody knows what's what's going on. But yeah, great stuff. Just in, about the, the USP, I mentioned it before about what you do, the referral from the firms, the wealth advisors, mortgage advisors. Going back to sort of, I mentioned it, I think we talked about it before, the referral, not from a customer point of view, but do you get many referrals from advisors to other advisors to, to link up with you? Uh, we have had a couple, yeah. Yeah, we have had a couple okay. um, where um, if they've been at a, a conference or a, a quilter event and yeah. they've got talking about it, and, they, and yeah, yeah. I mean, and it, that's really powerful, actually, and, and it's interesting that you raise that because we're, we're building testimonial from referring firms at the moment, uh, which is hugely, hugely powerful because we can talk about what we do, but let's face it, we've got a vested interest. But if somebody's been working for, with us for three or four years and um, – they're able to say, yeah, I, I had that. I was worried about losing the customer. I was worried about not getting feedback. I was worried about whatever. But they're able to say their their practical experience. That's very powerful for us. So it's something that's happened a little bit, and it's something yeah. we're now actively trying to promote through our own testimonial that we're we're getting from firms who refer to us. Amazing that you're seeing that. Uh, it's just a testament to the great work you're doing. You've got customer testimonials, which I'm sure you have. You've got um, other customer testimonials from those firms that were referring to you. But, yeah, amazing stuff. Absolutely loving hearing this. We could talk about it all day, couldn't we? Oh, <laughs> oh, we could. And I think it's just great that you're, you've are you managed to, I think coming from that training space, what I'm definitely hearing is you've really got that insight into one, what clients warm to, but also what makes a really successful advisor in the first place. So going back to that trust and the confidence in the you know, wealth or mortgage advisor sending it in to you, you're walking the walk, you're not just ticking boxes, you know, you're actually like taking that client through a journey and your and your team through a journey as well when they're they're going to give advice. What would be your if we were to ask what your number one if each of you uh next you've had like one thing you were gonna give um advice to other advisors, what would it what would be your one piece of advice they could take away? Um well, I think we've probably already said it, but you know, putting putting the client, the customer, at the centre of everything you do, um, because ultimately, you know, they they are the customer, and you know, it's understanding the position they're probably in when you meet them, uh, and making sure that your process addresses that in a way that they can understand. So, you know, take jargon out of it. You know, don't talk complicated products with them and all get get them to uh you know uh be at the center of your whole process so that ultimately uh at the end they come out of it with products that they understand uh and can afford um and that um you know they retain and and, and keep paying it's thinking like them isn't it what i've taken yeah. from it today it's thinking like them looking at everything you've got every process everything you do and thinking okay how would they react to this how would it be most easier for making things as easy as possible in order yeah. to get to that to that right yeah. place and if you ask people questions like what would you want to have happen if yeah then you're going to understand what they want uh, and then if you can then address that through what you've got um, in a way that they can afford it, then why wouldn't it work? Absolutely. And Nick, do you have any one piece of advice? Um, yeah, I, I think it's about making a decision that if protection is important to you and your clients, be honest about what you're going to do about it and then work it into your process as a business. Uh, make it something you always do. You always have the conversation. You have the same conversation or the same structured conversation 
And then if, if for whatever reason, you're not going to be able to write it, there are firms that you can refer to. And I'm not, I'm not pitching us. There are plenty of great protection firms out there. Refer it to somebody who you know will do a great job for you, but, but do one or the other. Man, because it is, and I think consumer duty is shining a light on protection and how important it is. So make a decision and then stick to it, I think is what I'd say. Absolutely. Fantastic stuff. That makes it, simplifies it a lot, doesn't it? Refer or sell, <laughs> or sell properly mm -hmm. if you are going to that. Thank you both so much. That's been really insightful. Amazing. Thanks so much. Thank you. It's Thank a pleasure. You.